Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, I want to share with you a few emails that were sent to me that I think are really interesting. Covering a couple different topics, uh, a single that was put out by the Tabernacle Choir, uh, some interesting things said in General Conference, and uh, it looks like we've had another couple of the most powerful manifestations of the Savior's power uh, since President Nelson said that in October 2022. Um, so a couple more <laughs> signs in the heavens. Uh, just, okay, so look at this. Let's start with the Tabernacle Choir. So I got a message from Cabria. Um, I'm going to start a little bit, a little bit down in her message. She says, I don't think it's coincidence that the choir at Tabernacle Square released this. So she sent like a, you know, a screen capture of something. And this is what it looks like. And it says, uh, Hosanna. After Johan uh, Pachelbel's Canon in D. I guess page 37. I don't know. But uh, instantly what stood out to me was Hosanna. We've talked about that quite a bit on the channel. I still think it's extremely significant that we did it in the April 2020 General Conference uh, and that a solemn assembly was called uh, for us to do that. And uh, we've looked at 3rd Nephi and how Hosanna shows up twice in 3rd Nephi before Christ comes. So for the Tabernacle Choir uh, to put this out, yeah, maybe. Maybe. Um by the way, I like this right here, Mexican fiesta party music. <laughs> I guess that's essential when you live in when you live in Arizona. That's where she's from. Uh me and her, we, we have mutual acquaintances because I used to live in Arizona. But uh <laughs> anyway, okay, so let's get back to her her message here. So later she says, Song for the Bridegroom. It's often used as the wedding march. Now, if you don't know what she's talking about, I'll try and do my best rendition of the wedding march. It's the one that's like da 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 Hopefully that rings a bell. I don't know. But yeah, it's you know, it's a famous wedding march or whatever. Um I try I try to look more into it. Um so here's the original song. I'll put a link for this in the description below. Again, it's by Johan Pachabel or Pachabel Canon in D major. So if what I just did didn't do it for you, you can come here and listen to it. And uh I wanted to see if I could find the lyrics for what the Tabernacle Choir did. Uh well, I was trying to find out anything I could about this song, and it, I, I, it was hard to do. Um, I'm not sure that what the Tabernacle Choir sung uh, to that music uh, was lyrics originally from that song. I don't know if they're like doing something separate. They're kind of like combining the two, doing like a fusion. I went to uh, the Tabernacle Choir's website, and, it, and you know, has all their albums right here. And uh, I couldn't find it here, but it is, in fact, you know, here's the screenshot that she sent. Um, oh, yeah, by the way, her phone is charged this time. And then <clears throat> I went to my uh, YouTube music, and, yeah, it's right here. The Tabernacle Choir at uh, Temple Square as a single. Because I, I, what I have clicked here is albums, and it's a single. So I don't know exactly when this came out, but... Uh, according to her screenshot, it says new release from Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. Uh, later, I tried to call her just to talk a little bit more about it, but she says, sorry, I'm driving around with my kiddos, so I can't chat. I just found it fascinating that the choir very rarely, in all caps, releases a single song. Almost, o almost always, it is an album of some sort. So for them to release a single and it be the song that most walked down the aisle to, at least in the Western world, I found that astonishing. Ushering in the bridegroom for the wedding feast. <clears throat> That's what it shouted to me. 
Uh, maybe it's because I'm piano uh, because, uh, sorry, maybe it's because I'm a piano and voice teacher. So I've always felt the spirit strongest through music, but it truly stood out to me, especially after uh, Bednar and President Nelson's wedding feast talks. Uh, also, the fact that the choir sang Jesus once of humble birth, which as far as I can tell, they haven't sung unless it's Christmas or Easter. Now, I'm assuming that she's referring to this last general conference. I, I was, Unfortunately, this, this conference, I wasn't paying attention to the hymns. But anyway, and then she says, Also, last Christmas devotional, 2022, the choir wore purple instead of a, of a Christmas color. So she's saying that if you don't, if you don't know, uh, purple is usually associated with royalty because back in the dark ages and before, uh, purple was the hardest color to, to produce, you know, for dyes. And so only royalty and rich people could afford it. So, uh, she, she's suggesting here, maybe that was because, you know, Christ is going to come and he's going to be king and, Maybe that's the color that uh, they would wear ahead of time. I don't know. But I do find it very interesting. Yes, I agree with you. Uh, a song called Hosanna, and I wish I had the lyrics, and I tried to look it up. I tried to listen to it. Well, I listened to this, but it was, you know, whenever it's like choir singing, sometimes it's hard to hear what they're actually saying. Um I did hear Hosanna. <laughs> I heard them sing Hosanna, so I got that. So if anyone has the lyrics, feel free to put it in the comments so everybody else can look at it. If you're uh, confident that it is the same as what they're singing in this song. And then uh, to put it to that to this particular song, Pachelbel's Canon in D, The Wedding March. That's very, very interesting. That's very interesting. So make of that what you will, but uh, Cabria, thank you for putting it on our radar. Now I'm going to go back uh, to earlier on in the message because she had another thing uh, that she said that I thought was interesting. She said, Ballard and Eyring, the two prophets for Jerusalem, they seem to be giving their final message today in ode and final testimony. So possibly... Uh, there would be some that would say, no, uh, the prophets have to literally be in the streets of the old city in Jerusalem and do that for three and a half years. Um, I, do, I do not take that point of view, but I'm just going to wait and see what actually happens. But a lot of times when we're talking about Jerusalem, we're talking about M Mount Zion, we're talking about New Jerusalem, or just Zion, or things like that, a lot of times it just has reference to the church. And so I have to wonder about that when we're talking about the two prophets in Jerusalem. Now, it seems that anyone that has expounded on those on those scriptures in Revelation um, and in a couple other places do seem to indicate that it will actually be in Jerusalem. Uh, but what that looks like, we don't know. It could just be all these prophets that uh, literally go to Jerusalem, and they go to the BYU Jerusalem Center, they go to these different places. Uh, I have no doubt that President Ballard and President Eyring have been to Jerusalem. So I don't know. I don't know. Now, I, I can hear people saying, well, no, they have to be killed. Uh, they, like, they have to be murdered. That's the, that's the way that the prophecy goes. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to put very much limitations. I'm going to be flexible and say, well, who knows? Maybe. Uh, I'll be satisfied once it actually happens, and then, and then at that point, um, you know, uh, solidify what happened and, and how it happened. But I thought it'd be good to go back and read those parts of their talks uh, so we can remember what she's referring to here. So first we're going to do, uh, this is uh, President, <clears throat> excuse me, this is President uh, Ballard's talk. And I don't think he said it in the talk, but on his social media, he said that um, this was not scripted. He didn't write out his talk before. In fact, you know what? I should pull that up. Okay. Yeah. He says it here. Okay. So he says, 
uh, I did not, let me zoom in, sorry. I did not read a prepared address today at General Conference. My eyes are getting dim as I approach 95, which makes it more difficult to see the teleprompter. However, I didn't want to allow this obstacle to keep me from sharing my testimony of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I declare my witness that Jesus Christ is our beloved Savior. He is our Redeemer. I testify that striving to live his commandments will bring peace and happiness into our lives. Through him, we may return to live with our Heavenly Father. I know this is true. My dear friends, please know that I love you and pray for you. May God bless each of us on our endeavors to follow him. Okay, so with that being said, let's see what he said uh, in his in his address or his talk. Um, this is maybe toward the end. He says, we're in the process of trying to prepare ourselves a day at a time to be a little better, be a little kinder, be a little more prepared for that day, which will surely come when we shall pass back into the presence of our Heavenly Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's getting a little closer for me. I'll soon be 95. Um, <clears throat> you know, is it a goodbye? I, I don't know. The reason why I would even consider that it might be a goodbye is because um, Bruce R. McConkie was famous for uh, giving his final uh, talk. In fact, you know what? I should pull that up too. Okay, so I'm sure that most of you have probably seen this. If you haven't, I would encourage you to watch it. Not just listen to what, I'm going to read it, but I would encourage you to watch it because uh, it's really emotional and you have to hear his voice and see his body language. And uh, it conveys so much more when you watch and listen to it. But it seems that he he knew that this was his last uh, general conference talk. Um, he really chokes up at the end here. It turns out, I never really looked into it, but he died of cancer at the age of 69. And uh, this is what he said. It's really interesting. And now, as pertaining to this perfect atonement wrought by the shedding of the blood of God, I testify that it took place in Gethsemane and at Gol Golgotha, and as pertaining to Jesus Christ, I testify that he is the son of the living God and was crucified for the sins of the world. He is our Lord, our God, and our King. Now look at this. This I know of myself, independent of any other person. Now, it's not really a secret that <clears throat> the prophet and the apostles, they have their own witness of Christ. And uh, it seems that it is like actual, literal. In fact, it was shared just recently. I did a um, I did a video about near death experiences of uh, a couple general authorities. One of them was David B. Haight of the Quorum of the Twelve, and he shared a near death experience where, in quite a bit of detail, in general conference he shared what he saw and essentially he said that he saw a panoramic of the savior's life and he saw all these like key moments and stuff and he uh witnessed it himself while he was having the near death experience so anyway i thought that was interesting this i know of myself independent of any other person i am one of his witnesses and in a coming day i shall feel the nail marks in his hands and in his feet and shall wet his feet with my tears. So there is uh, there is precedent for this happening. I, I don't know if it's happened any other time. If you know, uh, please put it in the comments. If you can think of another time that a, a general authority seemed to know that it was his last talk and um, said something like what Bruce R. McConkie did in his talk. So is is that is that what we're seeing here? You know, uh, this is President Ballard. He says, that's getting a little closer for me. I'll soon be 95. So uh, if we if we look at the ages here on my recently created spreadsheet, 
Um, so these are the ages of all the prophets and then how long they served as president. And uh, included in this list, I decided to put Dallin H. Oaks, Henry B. Eyring, and M. Russell Ballard because they currently make up the first presidency and President Ballard is the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And as of right now, he is, as of today, uh, which the day I'm recording this is Friday the 6th, he is 94 years old, 11 months, and 26 days. So he, his birthday is coming up uh, pretty soon. Now, before I get into what President Eyring said, and I notice I have something to fix right there, um, I want to point this out too. This is another one of my spreadsheets, one of the many that I <laughs> One of the many that I have. And I've shown this to you before. Uh, this is not new. So I went through, because <clears throat> you can find this on Wikipedia. I copied the data over. You can go through and uh, see how long everybody served in uh, the first presidency and what age they were. Um, actually, I think I, I manually did that by using the formulas here on on uh, Google Sheets. But anyway, um, I went through and I put it all together every time there was a change in the first presidency. And I color-coded all the ages, right? Uh, according to, like, the colors of the rainbow. So the closer you get to purple and stuff, like, the younger they were uh, when they passed away. And as you can see, so, like, starting at the top with Joseph Smith... And you go down, just pay attention to the colors. You can see that as time goes on, the first presidency tends to age more and more, you know, live longer, um, more or less. But especially, it looks like probably since maybe the 50s or so, this is where you start seeing some reds, meaning that uh, red would indicate that red is for if you're in your 90s. And then orange is for 80s, yellow is for 70s. So you start getting some reds, like with David O. McKay. He was in his 90s. Joseph Fielding Smith, Spencer W. Kimball, Gordon B. Hinckley, Thomas S. Monson. But what you'll notice is that it's not until right now, uh, with this first presidency and President Ballard as the acting first pre or the acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, it's only now that you, we're all in the red, with everybody being in their 90s. This I can, I can authoritatively say that this has not happened before in the church. And I don't go with the, well, you know, people are living longer nowadays. Yes, yes. But that doesn't take away from the fact that this is the first time that it happened. And I do take it to be some kind of sign. Uh, the reason why, ju just on this fact alone, that President Nelson keeps bringing up his age. He keeps bringing it up. He did it this last general conference in his one talk. He talked about the fact that he's 99 and he's living in his 100th year. So I think there's something to it. Whenever something happens that hasn't happened before, I think that we should stop and uh, pay attention to it. So President Ballard, 94, about to turn 95. Uh, President Eyring, he is 90 years old. And so is uh, President Oaks. And of course, President Nelson is 99 years old. Okay, so we have uh, President Ballard. And I, I don't know how many times there have been in general conference where someone didn't read a talk. If you know of any other time, feel free to put it in the comments below. Send me an email, whatever you want to do. But uh, this, at the very least, this is not common as far as I know. So that's something to pay attention to. And then uh, let's look at and see what President Eyring said in his talk uh, called Our Constant Companion. He says, We have heard again President Russell M. Nelson's warning that in coming days it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. That prophetic warning has led me to ponder what I, what I might teach my children, grandchildren, 
and great-grandchildren about how to have that crucial guidance in the difficult days ahead for them. So this message today is a brief letter to my descendants that might help them when I am not with them in the exciting days ahead. Uh, I want them to know what I have come to know that uh, could help them. So here you have two, uh, kind of referring to two talks in this conference, referring to the fact that they, they see that their time is almost up. Now, who knows? Uh, maybe we'll see them again next conference or, or maybe not. You know, 90 years old, that's a long time. We, we already went over in the United States. Let's do it again. Uh, average life expectancy, male, U.S. I thought this was different last time we looked this up. Okay, whatever. It doesn't matter. It still illustrates this, the same point. So according to this right here, as of in 2020, uh, it was 77.28 years. So they, they are well past that. Um, no doubt the word of wisdom uh, would have helped in that, as well as just leave, living clean lives. And I'm sure they've, ta- they've taken care of their bodies all these years. But the fact of the matter is they're, they're pretty well past the average life expectancy. And uh, so, yeah, it, it could happen it could happen any time, obviously. Um, and then, okay, and then that brings me to President Nelson because, you know, did he do something similar? Well, you know, like I said, we, I, we, uh, I referred to the fact that he mentioned his age at the very beginning of his talk. In fact, let's go there. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, I am deeply grateful to speak with you today. At my age, each new day brings wonderful as well as challenging surprises. Three weeks ago, I injured the muscles of my back. So while I have delivered more than 100 general conference addresses standing, today I thought I would do so sitting. I pray that the Spirit will carry my message into your hearts today. I recently celebrated my 99th birthday and thus commenced my 100th year of living. I'm often asked uh, the secret to living so long. A better question would be, what have I learned in nearly a century of living? And then he gets into the talk. Now, before I read this next part, uh, which which was inspired by this comment, I want to read this comment. Uh, This is from, I have to go to the thing, uh, Dipsy Doodle TV Selena Harvey. I have to do that because YouTube a while ago started doing this like handle thing right here where you have the at sign and then the, the name for the handle. Okay, but she says, President Nelson referring back to his first message as president, beginning with the end in mind, I feel like this talk, Think Celestial, and his first message are like bookends to his presidency. And that's a really good thought. I, I didn't really, I didn't really think about that. Um, so what, what is she talking about? Well, let's read it. Okay, he says, if I can find it, I'll have to do Control F, begin with. Okay, it's in this uh, green section right here. Okay, in my first message. As president of the church, I encouraged you I encouraged you to begin with the end in mind. This means making the celestial kingdom your eternal goal and then carefully considering where each of your decisions while here on earth will place you in the next world. So yeah. Here we are all these years later, you know, he is now the uh, oldest living prophet or apostle of this dispensation and um we're at his first conference where uh, he's not standing uh, to, to deliver his address, which makes me think back to like uh, Boyd K. Packer. I remember when he gave, I, I don't know if it was like one or more general conferences where um, 
he was there. He was present, but he was sitting down uh, because his health was declining. Uh, so I, I, I don't know that we're at the, that stage with President Nelson. I don't know if this is just truly just kind of a temporary thing. He hurt, he hurt his back muscles. Maybe we'll see him standing again the next general conference, but I don't know. Maybe not. And uh, we've taken note. Let me go to it. Prophets, talks. We've taken note that, um, you know, this is the least number of times that he's spoken in general conference. So his first general conference as president of the church, it was five times. And then after that, four, three, four, five. And then after that, four, four, three, 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 two, one. So it's, uh, it's been slowing down, you know, as maybe you would expect. Um, the other interesting thing about this is we've noted that with this talk, um, you can count it one of two ways. Either it was his 41st talk as president of the church, or it was his 40th. And what I mean by that is you remember that he, um, like if you go to the church website and, uh, you go to the general conference for April, 2020, it'll have Hosanna shout in its own uh, like thing that you can click and then read. But uh, he basically just gave the instructions of how to do the Hosanna shout. So I don't know that you would necessarily count that as a talk. If you don't, then that means that this last talk that he gave was his 40th talk, like his 40th true talk. So that's something interesting. It, so <clears throat> first talk uh, that was pre-recorded, First time as president of the church that he's only spoken once in general conference, and it was potentially his uh, 40th talk, depending on how you count it. And then it was also his second longest talk that he's given since he became president of the church. So a lot of things going on with that. Um, Let's go back here. If I can, geez, if I can find it again. Let me close out of this. That might help. No, better keep that up. So what does he mean, you know, in his first message? Well, he's not talking about a general conference talk. He is, in fact, talking about... uh, This was published in, uh, at the time, what was the Ensign. The April 2018 ensign and actually there may have been i can't remember i don't know hmm, i don't know if some of this or all this was actually published before let's see editor's note president russell m nelson set apart as 17th president of the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints on january 14th 2018 delivered these remarks oh here we go on january 16th 2018 that's what I thought. I, I knew that this was like put out before this enzyme. Okay. During a live broadcast from the annex of the Salt Lake Temple. He requested that his words be published in this this issue. Okay. So really, this was January 16th, 2018. Like right away. At the very, very beginning. And this is what he says. As a new presidency, we want to begin with the end in mind. For this reason, we're speaking to you today from a temple, the end for which each of us strives, sorry, the end for which each of us strives is to be endowed with power in a house of the Lord, sealed as families, faithful to covenants made in a temple that qualify us for the greatest gift of God, that that of eternal life. The ordinances of the temple and the covenants you make there are key to strengthening your life, your marriage, in family, and your ability to resist the attacks of the adversary. Your worship in the temple and your service there for your ancestors will bless you with increased personal revelation and peace and will fortify your commitment to stay on the covenant path. So, um, yeah, maybe, maybe it was a bookend. Maybe that's why he brought it up. Maybe that's why he said it this time and not you know, next conference or whatever, but maybe he knows that now it's going to be his time. Don't know. 
we'll just have to wait and see with all three of them. But the fact remains, you have these three talks, one from President Ballard, one from President Eyring, one from President Nelson, uh, which all of them are somewhat in the tone of uh, Bruce R. McConkie's final talk, uh, or at least they kind of make reference to their age and that they're coming to the end. So it's very interesting because the same cannot be said for last conference or the conference before that or anything like that. So you have three, not just one, but three times that this happens, three different people all in the same conference. Very interesting. Uh, thank you, Dipsy. Also, thank you, Cabria. Um, all right, what do we got now? Got a few more things I want to share with you. All right, this uh, email is from Lynn Bo. The, the subject line says, Climax and Reality. Hi, two interesting words President Nelson used in the April 2020 Ensign article. Thanks, Lynn Bo. So here we have screenshot. This one is uh, the future of the church, uh, preparing for, I think it's preparing for the second coming. It says, we are just building up to the climax of this last dispensation when the Savior's second coming becomes a reality. Again, things like this have not been said really before President Nelson. Most of the time it was a lot more vague or just kind of more, you know, pointing to the, the future. Not, not as like, it never felt as imminent as it, as it has with President Nelson. So... And uh, I, I have this um, quote already on my spreadsheet, but I, I thought, and we've covered it before, but I thought it'd be good going over this email again, just as a reminder. So again, this was April, 2020. We are just building up to the climax of this last dispensation when the Savior's second coming becomes a reality. And then this other screenshot, this is from... Oh, it looks like it's from the same article. The future of the church preparing the world for the Savior's second coming. Oh, and I think this is the part that I'm supposed to read. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is preparing the world for the day when, the, when, quote, the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, end quote, from Isaiah 11, 9. Now, for people that maybe don't get into watching for the signs. I don't really care that much about the second coming. They may just read that and assume, oh, well, that's uh, referring to missionary work and how it's, you know, we have all these missionaries now. We're, we're um, in more countries than we've ever been before. So that's what he's referring to. And no, nope, that's not what that scripture is about. That scripture and uh, we've covered this concept before on the channel. So let's go directly to the scripture. Isaiah 11, verse 9. But let's first, let's start with the uh, what it says in the chapter heading. The knowledge about God will cover the earth in the millennium. So we've talked many times about the fact that at the beginning, at the beginning of the millennium, there's going to be all this missionary work that's taking place. That essentially the church has been restored and, uh, or it, it's the, at least the foundation has been restored and everything necessary for exaltation and the restoration is ongoing. But this pre-millennial era from 1820 until now is preparation for the millennium. Um, as well as all the missionary work that's going to be done at the beginning of the millennium. So when you think about it like that, what he says there is pretty interesting. Let's We'll read it again, but first let's read the scripture. All right, so the scripture, the scripture says, <clears throat> They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And you guys, again, we've covered this before in other videos. This has been talked about quite a bit by, by many different people that 
the earth being full of the knowledge of the Lord is in reference to the millennium when um, when the wicked are removed from the earth and all the things that block the gospel from going to different places and to different people and um, a lot of the deception is going to be gone. Uh, not all of it because the millennium is still going to be mortal life and there's you still have to be tested, but it's not going to be as bad as it is now. It's going to be much easier for the gospel to spread. Uh, so much so that based on what we've read before, at some point in the millennium, all the older generations are going to pass away, like the ones that hold on to different uh, belief systems. They're all going to pass away or uh, everyone else is going to have joined the church. But at some point, we're going to get to the point where the entire world will be converted to the church. Um, and so that's what this is in reference to. And uh, just to solidify that a little bit, in case somebody's like, no, that's not what that means. I'm going to go to the Institute Manual um, for this verse. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. And it says, the sacred knowledge of God will prevail on earth. Truth from which no one can hide. Elder Orson Pratt wrote, quote, The knowledge of God will then cover the earth as the waters cover the mighty deep. There will be no place of ignorance, no place of darkness, no place for those that will not serve God. Why? Because Jesus, the, the, great, the great creator and also the great redeemer, will be himself on the earth. And his holy, his holy angels will be on the earth and all the resurrected saints that have died in former dispensations will all come forth and they will be on the earth. What a happy earth this creation will be when the, when the purifying process shall come and the earth be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the great deep. What a change. Travel then from one end of the earth to another. You can find no wicked man, no drunken man, no man to blasphemy the name of the great creator, no one to lay hold on his neighbor's goods and steal them no one to commit whoredoms, for all who commit whoredoms will be thrust down to hell, saith the Lord God Almighty. And all persons who commit sin will be sp speedily visited by the judgments of the Almighty. Um, yeah, that basically wraps up that section. So with that in mind, knowing what that scripture is about, let's read this again. And uh, this is basically like the subtitle um, for this article. Again, the name of the article is The Future of the Church, Preparing the World for the Savior's Second Coming. And then it says, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is preparing the world for the day when the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Or in other words, the second coming in the millennium and when the gospel is taken in the millennium to the entire world. That's what That's what we're preparing for right now. So, um, I just want to say thank you to Lynn Bo for sharing that. And uh, that is indeed interesting. Now, the last part of this video will have to do with some more signs in the heavens and more of the most powerful events that we've ever seen of their kind. So, the first one uh, well, may, this one maybe not the most powerful, but the next one will be. Okay, this one is from Rob and Cindy. The subject line is possible sighting of Christ's return. So, you know, that caught my interest. Jared, this was in my morning news feed. A new bright object suddenly appeared in the universe in an unexpected place. Scientists don't know what it is. I got goosebumps at the possibilities. Start at the one minute and, and 29 second mark. Sorry, the one minute and 29 second mark goes until one minute and 43. So uh, they provided a, a link to a YouTube video and I watched it. And then I uh, decided to go and, and verify, you know, go to uh, other sources and just verify it. And uh, this is what I came across. This is what I came up with. Uh, if this could please go away. Okay, we'll do it like that. Okay, this is from space.com. And there, there's many, 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 many other articles that cover this, this same thing. Hubble, 
<clears throat> sorry, Hubble telescope just witnessed a massive intergalactic explosion and astronomers can't explain it. So this is an article from today, uh, Friday the 6th. Okay. A mysterious cosmic explosion created a brilliant flash of light in the space between two galaxies over 3 billion light years away. Now, let me just stop right here. Um, I do, for the most part, trust astronomy, but I don't think that they have a perfect knowledge of things. And uh, some of the things that they detect, uh, it's uh, indirect. You know, it's it's using different, um, you know, detectors, instruments um, to de- detect different things, whether it be different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum or, you know, other things. So... I, I, no, I don't know. I don't know the science of detecting this kind of event, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, it's just an indirect observation. And so they're assuming that it's an explosion. Maybe it's not an explosion. Maybe it's something else. All right. The optical flash, uh, which was one of the brightest bursts of blue light in the universe, but lasted only a few days is the latest example of a rare breed of brief astronomical, okay, a rare breed of brief astronomical event called a luminous fast blue optical transient, or LFBOT, which uh, actually kind of looks like, if you look at that acronym, it kind of looks like lifeboat. <laughs> maybe, maybe like the Ark, Noah's Ark. LFBOTs, are a complete mystery. The first one uh, to be discovered wasn't observed until 2018. Okay, now that is really interesting. It would have been interesting if this was the only one. It would it would still be interesting. Um, but I feel like this fact makes it even more interesting that the first one was observed in 2018. Now, I'm going to go to a different article that talks about that one. So this is put out by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory website. And uh, the title of the article is Holy Cow, Mysterious Blast Studied with NASA Telescopes. And here it is right here. And it says, A brief and an unusual flash spotted in the night sky on June 16th 2018, puzzled astronomers and astrophysicists across the globe. The event called AT2018COW and nicknamed the cow after the coincidental final letters in its official name is unlike any celestial outburst ever seen before, prompting multiple theories about its source. Over three days, the cow produced a sudden explosion of light at least 10 times brighter than a typical supernova. And hopefully you know a supernova, that's when a star explodes. It's, that's one of the most powerful things that, that you can witness. But t- 10 times brighter than, than a typical supernova. And then it faded over the next few months. This unusual event occurred inside or near a star-forming galaxy known as CGCG13-068, located about 200 million light years away in the constell- in, the, in the constellation Hercules. The cow was first observed by the NASA funded Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System Telescope in Hawaii. Okay, I don't think I had anything else from this article. So I decided to go ahead and uh, put that on the on my timeline right here. We're going to look at that in just a minute. Uh, Because I've added a few more things to my uh, second coming timeline, but there's more to talk about. If I could ever find the article again. All right, here it is. Okay. Similar, Similar bursts of light are discovered at a rate of about one per year. And they are nicknamed after animals based on the last three letters in their designation. So it turns out that Wikipedia has an article uh, for these fast blue optical transient events or lifeboats or LFBOTs. Uh, I'm the only one that's called a lifeboat, just so you know. 
And here's a table, and this is all the ones that have happened. So you have the first one, uh, like that article said, in 2018. Remember, 2018 was President Nelson's first first year as president of the church. And there's so many different things that have happened uh, in that year. In the heavens, as well as in the world, but in the heavens. Now, one thing that I noticed on this uh, table is you have this one right here, which says that the, the date was at, uh, the date for this one was actually October 10th of 2016, which is, you know, two years before 2018. But I think the, the reason why they have it ordered this way is because um, I could be wrong about this, but f- from what I gather with a lot of these different like observations, like they'll have the telescopes, you know, looking at the skies, recording their data. And then it takes time for the, the data to process um, and be reviewed and stuff like that by a human. So I think what's going on here in the case of Octo- the October 10th, 2016, is that's probably when it was first like literally recorded um, with their instruments, but not, it, not reported, like not recognized by a human and then reported by a human until 2020. So I, I think that's what this means. Okay. But anyway, uh, there's something very interesting about this. Okay. So here is, here are all the lifeboats. Guess how many there have been starting with president Nelson's first year as president of the church. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This most recent one, uh, that's what this article is about, is the seventh. And uh, it looks like it was recorded April 10th of 2023. So, and as you can see, yeah, on average, it's about once a year. Uh, 2019, there wasn't one. So it goes 2018 and then two 2020s, 2021, 22, 23, and another one in 23, in 2023. So that is mighty fascinating. They start with President Nelson's first year as president of the church. And since that time, there have been seven. I don't know. And, And they don't know what these are. They have guesses, but they don't know. It says other lifeboats have been dubbed the camel, the koala, the Tasmanian devil, right? That's because, like they said, the, the last letters, like here you have koala, uh, here, what do they call this one? The camel, whatever, okay. Um, TSD, Tasmanian devil. <laughs> and then the most recent one, FHN, Finch. So they're just like making those names up based on those last letters. Okay. Um, okay. We just talked about that. Okay. So, and when it did, astronomers made a shocking observation. Finch. So the most recent one in April, Finch was not in a galaxy at all. All previous lifeboats have been observed in the spiral arms of galaxies but Hubble observed that Finch was in intergalactic space about 50,000 years from one large spiral galaxy and 15,000 light years from a small galaxy. And uh, it looks like here's like a picture of it. Here's Finch. So here's the explosion of light that they don't know what it is. And uh, yeah, it is not in, (laughs) it is not in any of these galaxies. It's just out in in open space, far away from anything. So I take it from this article that uh, this is the first time that this has been observed. All other lifeboats have been observed within um, a galaxy. Its location would seem to go against the possibility that it could be the supernova of 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 an exploding massive star. While there are rogue stars that get flung out of a galaxy and into intergalactic space following an encounter with with a supermassive black hole, massive stars live only a few million years before going supernova, which is not enough time for a star to get all the way out there. 
So you see what they're saying? It's like you do have stars that get flung out of galaxies, but they usually fizzle out and explode before they would get this far. So something something weird is happening with this. Quote, the more we learn about lifeboats, the more they surprise us. Ashley Crimes or Crims, uh, I don't know, a research fellow at the European Space Agency and lead author of a new paper describing the, the recently observed lifeboat uh, said in a statement. Continuing, she says, we've shown that lifeboats can occur a long way from the center of the nearest galaxy and the location of the Finch is not what we expected of any kind of supernova, end quote. Uh, Crimes or Crims in his team, oh, it's a guy? Oh, okay, sorry, I'm sorry. Crimes and his team are focusing on two possible explanations. One is that the Finch was a flash, a flash of light caused by a star being ripped apart by an, by an intermediate mass black hole, which is a black hole with a mass between 100 and a few thousand times the mass of the sun. Alternatively, the Finch might have been a kilonova or a kilonova, which is the explosion resulting from the collision of two neutron stars, or sometimes between a neutron star and a black hole. So th- that, that's their guesses. Uh, either a ripped apart star by a black hole, or two neutron stars smashing into each other, or a neutron star smashing into a black hole. And then at the end it says, uh, quote, the discovery poses many more questions than it answers. More work is needed to figure out which of the many possible explanations is the right one. Okay, so this is weird. Um, is it the sign of the Son of Man? I don't know. Maybe. Who knows? Maybe it'll come toward the Earth. But it seems that there's been other ones, and this is the seventh. So maybe this is some kind of... Uh, you know, count down or count up to seven or something like that, or maybe nothing at all, but it's interesting to note. Now, uh, by the way, thank you, Rob and Cindy, for pointing that out. Uh, my next thing that I want to go over before going over to the second coming timeline is uh, an email I got from Jan- Jim Van Sickle. The subject line says, scientists discover the highest energy gamma rays ever from a pulsar. Hi, Jared. This is a new one, Jim. Okay, so um, now this is interesting because I, w- I want to remind you what, pres- what President Nelson said October 2022. But my dear brothers and sisters, so many wonderful things are ahead. In coming days, we, we will see the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power that the world has ever seen. Between now and the time he returns with power and great glory, he will bestow countless privileges, blessings, and miracles upon the faithful. Now, for me, undoubtedly, when he's talking about the greatest manifestations of the Savior's power, I think that a lot of that has to do with um, for, uh, for forwarding the work of the kingdom and preparing for the second coming and maybe even key events of the second coming itself, like the resurrection and stuff like that. I, I But at the same time, I wouldn't be surprised if there were other things going on uh, that were also the most powerful things that the world has ever seen. So, for example, before we get into this uh, most recent story, if we go to the timeline right here, let's go back to 2022 when he said that. All right, so here we are in October. So exactly one week after he said that, and in that, in that year, it was the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles at sundown. The world saw the most powerful explosion ever seen. Gamma ray burst GRB-221-009A. That was literally, literally <clears throat> the most powerful thing that humanity has ever recorded. It happened exactly one week after he said that. So, okay, so that's interesting. Uh, what else has there been? There's been uh, a few more things. 
I have, I have to find them though. <laughs> Give me just a second. Um, come on, where is it? Oh yeah, well no, I'll I'll skip that. Okay, so in April, um, so about six months later, AT two zero two three FHN or Finch was discovered. The the lifeboat that we were talking about. Um, <clears throat> and that was the seventh discovered so far. And these things are, are things that are brighter than typical uh, supernovas. So that's interesting. Uh, by the way, Betelgeuse, the, the main star of the Orion constellation, the right shoulder, uh, it began shining 150% its usual brightest, going from 10, the 10th bright, brightest star in the sky to the 7th brightest star. So there's another 7 in uh, the month of April. And then uh, May 3rd, 2023 we witnessed the most powerful solar flare ever recorded. Not from our sun, thank goodness, but in the star system V1355 Orionis. The largest solar flare ever recorded. And then, uh, if we just go to present, right? Yeah, then we have this. And this is the most recent event on my uh, spreadsheet. In three days, or for you watching this, uh, in two days, we're going to have two temples that are dedicated, the McAllen, Te the McAllen, Texas Temple and Feather River, California Temple. But um, today, Friday the 5th of October, Vela Pulsar, that's the name of the pulsar, highest ever energy from gamma rays from a pulsar discovered so we're seeing a lot of like really powerful things in space that we have never seen before and they've all happened since president nelson said that we we would see the greatest manifestations of the savior's power that the world has ever seen uh, it would seem that at least in one sense in an astronomical sense that has literally uh been true so let's read a little bit about it and then we'll we'll end this video this is from uh, fizz.org. Scientists discover the highest energy gamma rays ever from a pulsar. Scientists using the HESS observatory in Na Namibia have detected the highest energy gamma rays ever from a dead star called a pulsar. The energy of these gamma rays clocked in at 20 tera electronovolts electron volts, or about 10 trillion times the energy of visible light. Pulsars are the leftover corpses of stars that spectacularly explode in a supernova. The explosions leave behind a tiny dead star with a diameter of just 20 kilometers, rotating extremely fast and endowed with an enormous magnetic field. Okay, so one of these tiny tiny little dead stars spinning around really fast. We just observed the highest energy uh, of gamma rays coming from one of these. It just happened this year. Later on in the article, um, it says, quote, that is about 200 times more energetic than all radiation ever detected before from this object, says co-author Christo Venter, from the Northwest University in South Africa. This very high energy component appears at the same time, or sorry, appears at the same phase intervals as the one observed in the GEV range. However, to attain these energies, the electrons might have to travel, travel even farther than the magnetosphere, yet the rotational emission pattern seems to remain intact. Quote, this result challenges our previous knowledge of pulsars and requires a rethinking of how these natural accelerators work, end quote. Says um, Arache Dijanati Atai from the Astroparticle and Cosmology or APC Laboratory in France who led the research. So I have that highlighted because, again, we're, we're reminded again and again, science is not complete and they don't know everything. You know, 
you can take all these these um pieces to the puzzle and try and put together a picture and you may get kind of a picture but ultimately we don't know there's so many things that we do not know we don't understand about space or even just the world in general that's why i think it's always so preposterous whenever someone that's scientifically minded or secular uh, dismisses the idea of god and they think that it's proven that god doesn't exist or there's enough evidence that god doesn't exist Based on what? Based on an incomplete, a, a spectacularly incomplete picture of how the universe works? There's so much that we don't know, and you're going to say that God doesn't exist? Give me a break. All right. And then later it says, whatever the explanation, uh, next to its other super, superlatives, the Vela, po- sorry, the Vela Pulsar now officially holds the record as the pulsar with the highest energy gamma rays discovered to date. So add another most powerful thing that we've ever seen to the list. Um, And that is going to, yeah, that's going to wrap it up. So thank you everybody for your emails. Uh, I I just, it always makes me wonder what are, what are we going to see next? What's the next, what's the next sign? How big is it going to be? Um, it just seems like they keep coming day after day after day. It's just nonstop. I feel like we're in that time where there's a compression of events because it's just, it's so intense. All right, but that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later.